Let's jump into it. You ready? Now you, you might as well, uh, we, we're going to do a walk through this morning. And we're going to begin in Ezra chapter 1. And we'll get there in a minute. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you we're in Ezra chapter 1 because most folks, it'll take you a while to find that. Glory, hallelujah. Ezra chapter 1, that's back there in, in, in the back of the... In the back of the book that you, you don't read a whole lot, and yet I've come to understand that sometimes the, the places that we don't tend to go to and read a lot in the Bible are the exact ones that God needs us to go to and, and, and to read that some of the greatest truths are there for us and not in the familiar scriptures as such, but in the ones that we may not dig into to find out. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and, and Zechariah and Haggai are called restoration books. And restoration teaching, um, the restoration truths of the Word of God are, are found ex- incredibly clearly here in, in these books. And uh, restoration is a gift of God to you and I. Restoration is also a road that must be traveled. You need to tell your neighbor that. Say, neighbor, restoration's got to be traveled. It's a road that's got to be traveled. It's something that we have to move in. We have to go with. The message of restoration is one of the most exciting messages in the Word of God. In fact, it is pretty much the whole revelation of the Bible. It's the revelation of salvation itself. And we're speaking of restoration and God doing restorative work in our lives and and in the church and ultimately in the world around us. We're talking about the message of the Word of God. You see, your salvation is a restoration. It's called being born, help me, born again. There you go. And and being born again means we've already been born once and something must have happened that ruined it. And we've studied in this and seen already that sin ruins a lot of stuff. It ruins our lives. It ruins our families. It ruins the world around us. It ruins our churches. It causes ruin. Something is destroyed when sin enters into it. And sin entered in to the human race through Adam and, and Eve. And uh, we, truth be matter to be told, though, we really can't go back and just blame them. The sin nature is there in us from the start. But the truth of the matter is this. God says, okay, if you want to be righteous, I'll give you the law. And He gave us the Ten Commandments and the law of Moses. And He said, here, you, you think you can come out of this on your own? Here's my righteous standard. Here's my holiness. Here's what you got to do. And we flunked it every turn. So my point is simply this, is that not only is it the sin nature that is, is, comes through Adam spiritually, but it's also our own volition, our own acts of sin that we do ourselves. We have the righteous law of God in, in front of us, and yet we can't keep it in and of ourselves. Something has to change. Something has to be restored. We need to have something placed back in us that was ruined earlier on. That's what it means to be born again. When we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, our sins are forgiven. God totally wipes them out and He places His Spirit back within us and causes our fallen or sinful human spirit to be born again. You see, you are a tripartite being. You are three parts. Just as there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, you are body, soul, and spirit. Salvation does not start in the body. Salvation does not start in the soul. Salvation begins in the spirit of men and women. That spirit must be born again. God comes in and does a new thing in us. And I love what the Apostle Paul said in in, in the book of Philippians when he said, Therefore, work your salvation out with fear and trembling. He wasn't talking about working for your salvation. He was saying salvation's already in you. And now our responsibility is that which God has placed in us by His Spirit must now be worked out into our soul and in action through our bodies. You and I are never working from a place of defeat. You and I are always working from a place of victory. Tell your neighbor, I'm a victor. You're a victor and you see the devil wants us to back this thing up. He wants us to work from the body to the soul and then hope we can get our spirit in line. It does not work that way. You can't operate that way. That's religion. Religion's trying to put you in a mold. Religion's trying to, to, to place uh, rules and regulations on you. The religion's trying to conform you to an appearance of godliness. And you might be able to paint the barn pretty good. 
But if everything inside the barn's still still rotten and falling down, I don't care how good that barn looks on the outside, it's going to eventually crumble. But when you come in and you redo the thing from the inside out, every restorer knows that you always begin with what's the most important to begin with. You can go buy a car to restore it, but if you don't start with the engine, you can forget about the rest of it. Otherwise, you're going to have a nice shiny vehicle there that's not going anywhere. Somebody help me here this morning. I'm already in good flow. So we got to begin with what counts. And if you want the thing to run, if you expect to use it and drive it, then you have to take care of the internal parts first. Once you get the internal parts going right, then everything else falls into place. As a matter of fact, it's far more exciting to get something running first and get it like you want it there and then start working on the outside so the outside matches how good it is on the inside. Glory, hallelujah. It's exciting to know. That God's plan for you and I is restoration. He fully intends to restore us. He intends to restore you and I. No matter what your situation has been in life, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you're going through right now, God's purpose is already in the midst of your ruin that you be restored. That's how much God loves us. God did not, God did not allow things to come into our lives as, as a lot of folks want to blame God for everything. The devil does it sometimes. Sometimes our own stupidity does it. But when the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises a standard up against the enemy. And it begins with the promise of restoration. Now, a lot of folks are willing to receive this word with great enthusiasm. After all, it is good news, isn't it? I mean, that's not, that's not bad. You know, in the midst of your mess, that God's already made a promise to restore you. And that restorative promise is not just that you come back as good as you were. The, restor- the restoration promise is this, is that you're going to come back better. It, you're going to come back better than you were before. That's that's the promise of God. Why? Because when God puts something back together, He puts it back together than it was. Better than it was. Because you see, if it messed up, oh, hallelujah. It, if you were able to mess it up the first time, God doesn't want you to mess it up the second time. So He's going to make sure that He puts something more back towards you for you so that you're not as likely to mess it up the second time as you were the first time. So His restorative promises are always at least with interest. Glory, hallelujah. They're at least twofold, sometimes sevenfold. And there is a promise in the Word of God that for those that abandon all for the Lord Jesus and who are determined to walk into the kingdom, whether they leave farms, mothers, brothers, sisters, businesses, whatever, the Lord Jesus said that there was going to be a hundredfold return for those in this life and the next. That's pretty good stuff. You see, what it is is this. is We, we need to understand that when we come to the Lord, we have to come just as we are. I mean, with all our mess, all our stuff, we've got to come just like we are. We've got to come with everything that we have. You see, it, it, the, the message preaches... Now, you're going to have to hang in here with me, all right? The message preach, preaches better to a needy people. But the same message goes to those who think they have everything. Because the message is deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And, and, and the promise is there. And, and, and folks that don't seem to have any need need to understand that if I'm willing to give up everything I have to go with the Lord, then the Lord's going to increase and restore. Oh, you're not listening to me. It, it, what we don't understand is this, is that we receive this message of restoration and we receive it in excitement and we don't realize that the seed is not the fruit. You see, for five weeks I've been teaching on this and people have been going out of here going, yes! And I want you walking out of here this morning going, yes, this is really, really good. But what you need to understand is you've just received the seed. But you haven't got the fruition yet. The fruit hadn't come from it yet. And some of you are already backsliding. Preach on, preacher. You're already backsliding. What do I mean by that? Is you, you, you gave God a week to fully restore you and it didn't happen and you're already back down in the dumps. <laughs> well, I thought God was going to restore me. He did, but it's in seed form. Now you've got to walk it out. Now you've got to work it out. But I don't want to work. Sorry. Man don't work, he doesn't eat. That's spiritual principle. You can say what you want, but that's a spiritual principle. If you're not 
willing to work it out. If you're not willing to walk the road out, then you're not going to receive the restoration. And the lie of the enemy that he comes in to try to steal that seed from you is that he tests that as soon as it happens. Because, see, most of us in here, we've been teaching on restoration and, 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 and it's wonderful and we're all excited about it and I'm excited about it. But probably in the last five weeks, some of you been, have been through some stuff that you haven't been through in the last five years. You've already been tested. You see, it's the devil's job to test. He's, he's, he's just a pawn in the hand of the Lord. You need to understand that. The devil is a defeated foe. So what he is allowed to do or to bring against us, it's just to strengthen us. It's just to see if we really mean it. Do we really believe it? You see, it's one thing to say, yeah, I believe it. And it's another thing to say, God, as bad as I'm hurting right now, I choose to believe this. I choose to move in this. And you can't let the devil steal that from you. The things of God take time. I'm getting to the Scripture. Hang on. The things of God take time. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I got some gray hair, and, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm not as old as some of you, but I'm older than, than most of you. And, and you've heard me say this before, but it's honest to God's truth. God is just not into microwave cooking. He's just not. He doesn't operate that way. A day is as a thousand years to Him and a thousand years is as a day. He can take a short time to do it and He can take a long time to do it. And I have come to decide this, that He always takes whatever the right time is to do it. And, and there's a suddenly coming to this house. And there's a suddenly coming into your life. Tell your neighbor, you got a suddenly coming. There's a suddenly coming. But it's going to be after you've walked the road. The thing is, you're going to get so encouraged and, and walking the road that the suddenly is going to happen and you're still going to say, man, I can't believe that happened the way it did now. Why? Because when God brings the suddenly, He does it in such an awesomely increasing way that everything you've done to get there was nothing. Every tear you shed, every, every prayer you prayed, every day you had to fight through depression, every day you had to fight with the devil uh, using the Word of God, everything's just going to fade in the past because there's that suddenly. But God's into bringing us into suddenlies. You know, Job got restored. Glory, hallelujah. I, I don't know how long it took for everything to be gone, but it wasn't long. A few weeks, a few months at most. Job lost everything. He lost his wealth. He lost his family. Uh, he, he, lost his, uh, he lost his health. Uh, he lost all his cattle. He lost all his donkeys. He lost all his camels. He lost everything and was left with nothing but a piece of broken pottery to scratch the bulls. On his body. And then after God got done processing, everybody say processing. After God got done processing him, he said, Job, you're restored. Woo! And when God's done processing you, you're restored. But how many understand that it took a while for Job to rebuild the buildings? How many understand that it took it took a while for all those cattle and donkey, cattle and donkey and horses and camels or whatever it was that Job had. It took a while for them to reproduce to have twice as many as he had before. How many know it, it, it took a while to raise more children than he had before? Well, I'm losing you. I can tell you. I'm starting to just like, oh God, Pastor, you're talking about a whole nother lifetime, exactly. Job's twofold return came to him in fullness. And at the end of his days, he was blessed twice as what he was in his former days. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't care what the process is. But one of these days when I come to the end of my days and I realize that God's given me twofold, sevenfold as much as I could have ever had if I hadn't lost what I had. The key is, are you going to walk it out? The key is, 
Are you going to do what's necessary? You see, there's a trap that Satan uses on you and I that we've got to be careful not to fall into. And that's to not let him rob the seed that's already put in our hearts to succeed. Now, my assignment this morning is to take you down a road to encourage you in this truth called restoration. And I'm going to do it by walking you through Ezra, Nehemiah, Haggai, and Zechariah. And let me just sort of catch you up. These are the restoration books. Here's, here's what happened. After 70 years of Babylonian captivity, the first waves of the Israelites began to come back to the promised land. They began to come back specifically to Jerusalem. And they came back in three waves. They came back uh, with Zerubbabel first to rebuild the temple. They came back with um, Ezra who came back and restored the Word. They had the, they'd had the temple. Now they needed the Word. Right, And then, if, then a, uh, a while later, uh, a man named Nehemiah came and rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. Notice, notice the pattern of restoration here. First, you rebuild the temple of God. First, you get God back in your midst. Secondly, you get the Word of God back in your heart and mind. And then thirdly, you begin to build around you what is necessary to have a kingdom entity. Now, we're going to get deeper in that in the weeks to come. But they're coming back now, this Babylonian captivity. They've been there for, for 70 years. And, and they're coming out. And all these leaders and all these people that came back with them faced tremendous challenges. And they needed to return to, to the promised land to be able to fulfill the call of God on their life and rebuild the temple. Now, the Spirit of God stirred these people and supplied what they needed to return to the promised land that had been taken from them 70 years before. Ezra 1, are you there? Did you find it? Glory, hallelujah. Kudos to you. Ezra 1, 5 says this, Then the heads of the fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose, even everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. So they got the word from the king. They got the word from Cyrus. Cyrus went back and began to look on the old records and he saw that uh, Isaiah had written about him before he even was. Woo, that's exciting. And he looked and he saw that he was to restore the people back to the land. He was to restore them back to rebuild the temple. So not only did he set a group free, all those who were stirred in heart. And maybe you know the Holy Spirit's got to stir your heart before you're going to do anything. The Holy Spirit began to stir their hearts and the king sent them back with Zerubbabel, not only just releasing them to go, but he gave them all the old utensils that had been stolen from the temple so they could take it back with them so they could restore the foundational things. Now I could get chasing rabbits this morning like crazy, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay on path. But how many of you know that those people that were stirred, anybody in here been stirred? Anybody ever been excited? We, we've been excited. This house is excited about being a church plant and, and doing something fresh and, 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 and walking with God in, in, in a restorative way. That, that excites us. It excites me. It still excites me. And we're talking about weeks of walking to get back to Jerusalem. And don't you know that when they came carrying all the things of the house of God with them, they had all the ornaments and and, and all the utensils and, and, and gold and silver and everything that they needed to put back in the temple that they would rebuild. Don't you know that for those those few weeks that they were walking from Babylon back to Jerusalem, that they were dancing all the way? Woo! We're going to restore! We're going to... Restore! God sent us to restore the temple. God's calling us to do this. We're coming out of Babylonian bondage. I'm excited. You're excited. It's all going to be great. And every morning they got up and they couldn't wait to get on their camels and donkeys and keep on riding to Jerusalem. It's going to be great. Glory. Hallelujah. And then they got there. <laughs> Yeah, then they got there. You see, they didn't realize the problems they were going to face by going back to restore something that had been lost. They saw the devastation of the city in front of them. It was in rubbles, in rubble. There was rubble everywhere. And they had to first clean up the rubble before they could even begin to rebuild anything. 
Imagine. I mean, from 70 years prior, the temple was in, in, in shambles. It was, the, it, it, was, it was gone. The rock it was made out of was, was strewn out everywhere. The walls of Jerusalem had fallen down and, and the rock and the rubble were everywhere. Their homes had been destroyed and the rubble was everywhere. It was everywhere. And nobody had touched a rock. And here they come back to the city. And the first thing they're faced with is dealing with all the rubble from the judgment they would just gone through. Don't get discouraged when God makes you deal with the past before He helps you rebuild your future. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going to have to find someplace else to preach. Let, let me... Don't get discouraged when God makes you deal with the past before He helps you rebuild your future. He wants you to have a fresh start. He wants you to have a clean foundation. He wants you to repent where necessary. He wants you to deal with the sin that was in your life before. It, it, it's all right. I, I, I fully believe that when, when the blood of Jesus cleanses us, we are absolutely, totally free and, and it's separated from us as far as the east is from the west. The blood of Jesus is complete and we don't have to live back there in the stuff. But I think it's okay every once in a while to be reminded of the rubble that was once in our lives so we choose not to go back there. And I think it's a good thing that even though restored, the Spirit of God makes us walk through some hard things before we can start rebuilding. Because if we're reminded how hard it is to clean a mess up, we're not near as likely to make a mess again. It's kind of like when you put weight on. Oh, I knew that silence, everybody. I, I knew. I mean, we won't get it down here where we live, right? Man, it was easy to put that 30, 40 pounds on. It was a little harder to make the decision that I'm going to get it off. But it is hell what you have to go through to get that 30, 40 pounds off so you can get back into fighting shape. And I am convinced that it is so hard so that once you get to fighting shape, you don't ever want to get out of shape again. (laughs) They were surprised and became fearful because of the opposition they faced when they returned to rebuild. Now, I encourage you to read these, these, four, these four books. They're not that long this week. And see what these people faced. Ezra 3.3 3 says, So they set up the altar on its foundation, for they were terrified because of the peoples of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, and burnt offerings morning and evening. They came back and they thought everybody was going to be formed. They're coming back to help. We're going to rebuild Jerusalem. But the people there resisted it. Ezra 4, 5 says this. Ezra 4, 4 through 5 says this. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Imagine that. You're just trying to do good. Tell your neighbor, I'm just trying to do good. But the people of the land, the people that they returned to, didn't want them doing good. I'm going to show you something here in a second. I'm going to mess with you bad. Nehemiah 6, 9 says this, For all of them were trying to frighten us, thinking that we would become discouraged with the work and it will not be done. But now, O God, strengthen my hands. That was a prayer of Nehemiah. You see, those who returned probably thought the people of Jerusalem would be excited that they've come to help them rebuild that which was torn down. But it wasn't that way. You see, some people are happy 
in their rubble. It's their rubble. They've lived in it 70 years. This is the way it is. Don't change it. But it's rubble. Doesn't matter. It's our rubble. But don't you, don't, don't you see what, what, what could, what it could be? Don't, don't you understand what could happen if we can get the rubble out of here and if we can get everybody pulled together? We can build some, we can restore something. God sent us to restore. Nope. Nope, it's our rubble. We'd rather live in the rubble of the past than the hope of the future. You'd be amazed how many people want to live in the rubble of their past rather than clear it out and build something new to the glory of God. Well, I, I got some more, you okay? That's why your obedience to move on in the things of God will anger those around you. Because you're exposing their unwillingness to deal with their own mess. You, you, you just need to know, you, you're going to have folks get upset with you as soon as you say, I'm coming out of this mess. The, the, your your family, some of your family is going to get upset with you. Some of your friends are going to get upset with you. Church folk are going to get upset with you as soon as you say, God's got something for me. I'm going to be restored. I'm going to claim the promises of God. I believe there is more to have in the Spirit. Let me tell you something. What you are doing is this. Is you are exposing their apathy. The minute you say, there's got to be more in God. There's got to be more for me. I believe God is, has got things that we haven't even touched yet. And I've got to reach for it. I've got to go for it. I don't care if my life's a wreck. I don't care what happened. I may have been ruined. i got promises of restoration. And I'm gonna, my life's going to change. I'm going to trust God. And I'm going to move on. And people get upset with you. Why? Because they'd live, let, rather live in their rubble. And the fact that you say you're coming out and the very fact that you begin to come out and begin to do something, you begin to act on the Word that now you say you believe, you're going to have folks around you going, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? I'm a Christian too. I go to church. Praise God, I'm glad you're a Christian. I'm glad you go to church. But are you seeking the Lord? With all your heart, mind, body, soul, and spirit. Are you believing Him for great things? Do you believe that the glory of the latter house is supposed to be greater than the glory of the former house? Do you, uh, are you satisfied with church as usual? Or are you planting seeds? Are you beginning to seek the Lord to see just what God might be able to do if we broke the mold, if we changed things up? If, uh, mm, People became so discouraged that the work on the temple stopped for 18 years. 18 years. Why? Because the people became frightened. The naysayers started braying. They began mocking the new work they were doing. They began attacking people. They began writing letters about them. They, they did everything they could to discourage the people. They, they said, we're going to kill you. Of course, now people today won't say, we're going to kill you. They say, God's going to kill you. We put a spiritual twist on it. How dare you do what you're doing? God's going to strike you dead. Mm. Mm. Folks, listen. When you step out to do something for the Lord, when God stirs your spirit to do something different, there's going to be serious opposition. And you need to understand that. Because the devil knows if he can't steal the seed before it's sprouted good and put roots in, 
you're probably going to take off and come to fruition. You're going to get your promise. So he, he's got to come against you. And you, you, you've got to decide the strongest opposition that the people of God faced that came back to restore were from the people that were already in the land. It, it's an amazing thing. It was the people who, it was the Jews who had been left in Jerusalem and they intermarried with the Babylonians. By the way, in case you didn't know it, those were called the Samaritans in Jesus' day. And they were the ones that didn't want anything to change. Because they had intermarried with the ways of Babylon. And these Jews that came back to restore came back to do something restorative in nature. Back to the way God wanted things done. Remember this. It's easier for God to get you out of Babylon than it is for Him to get Babylon out of you. God can deliver you from physical Babylon in a day. He can change your circumstances in a day. But it takes Him a while for Him to get all your Babylonian stuff out of you. The people became discouraged that the work of the temple had stopped for 18 years. My question is this, is how did God encourage them to keep going? The same way He's going to encourage you and I to keep going. The principles of God remain the same. In Ezra chapter 5, verse 1 says this, When the prophets Haggai the prophet of, and Zechariah the son of Ido prophesied to the Jews who were in Judea and Jerusalem in the name of the Lord of Israel who was over them, then Zerubbabel the son of, yep, whatever his name is, shall tell, and Joshua the son of Joseph, yep, him, arose and began. I can speak in tongues, but I cannot read that at all. I'm telling you, it just makes me nuts. <laughs> yep. They arose and began to rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. One more scripture, then I'm going to comment. Ezra 6.14 says this, And the elders and the Jews were successful in building through the prophesying of Haggai and the prophet Zechariah. What did God do for them? He sent them a now word that encouraged them. Come on, you know you need a now word every once in a while. You, you need to hear God speak to you every once in a while. Some of y'all in here this morning, and you, you, you need a word from God this morning. I, I'm bringing you that word because my assignment was to encourage you this day. We all need that word of encouragement. I mean, we can be going strong and believe in God, and the enemy can come in pretty strong sometimes, and, and, and fear and doubt can begin to enter back in. And every once in a while, we need a word from the Lord to encourage us. And that's what Zechariah and Haggai did. They came in with a word to encourage Encourage the people to get on with what it was. They gave him three things. I'm going to give them to you quickly. First is this. Through Haggai, he said, stay focused, I'm with you. Stay focused, I'm with you. Haggai 1.13 says, Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke... But Now, I've, I'm not even going to give you time to find Haggai because you all going to have to go to the index and find out where the page number is to get to that because that's a little old bitty book back there, but it is full of precious promises. Haggai 1.13 says, Then Haggai, the message of the Lord, spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people, saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. You'll find in the preceding verses in chapter 1, Haggai gets on them a little bit. He admonishes them. He said, You need to get back to the task at hand. He said, you become so concerned about your own life that you forgot about rebuilding the temple. He said, you're fixing your own houses up. You're getting on with your own life, but you have neglected the work that God called you to do. You have neglected doing the restorative work. You've come back. You've got your house in order, but now you've become apathetical in the things of God. Oh, how the church needs to hear that this morning. We, we get so concerned about our own stuff. So Haggai first, tell, Haggai first comes and tells them, he says, you got to get your focus back on the Lord. You, you're called for a purpose. You, you weren't called. You were not called to live your own life. You were called to fulfill a purpose and a destiny. You say, well, it's my life. Well, if you want it, 
But Jesus said, he who loses his sake, his, his life for my sake, finds it. So if you want to live your way and do your own thing and, and think you're going to find satisfaction, just have at it. Because sooner or later you're going to find it doesn't matter how successful you are. It doesn't matter what comes, what happens in your life. You are never going to be fulfilled. But as soon as you determine that you're going to get back in on the things of God and what God has for you and the purposes God has for your life, my friend, when those things begin to come to fruition, there's going to be a satisfaction and a fulfillment in life. I, I, I'm just telling you, I've lived this long enough, I can tell you. It, it, it's, it's, it's in God. It, it's in following Jesus. And He says, I am with you. He said, tell them I am with you. Folks, if the Lord is with you, stop worrying about everything else that is going on around you. The promise of your every need being met comes to those who first seek the things of the kingdom. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom and all these things shall be added to you. You don't need to feel the Lord. You just need to know His promise. You, you, you don't need a feeling. I like a feeling. I, I, I like a feeling that gives me goosebumps. I like a feeling that makes me swimmy headed. I, I, I like a feeling that puts me on the floor. But I don't walk in this by what I feel. I walk in this by what God has said. And when your circumstances are the roughest and you're feeling the worst, that's when you've got to stand on what the Word of God says and faith kicks in for the promise. See, most folks think when they get into that battle, it looks like it's going to kill them. They don't understand that that's going to be their victory dance. The enemy's blowing the... The trumpet that you're defeated, he's already starting to jump up and down. And you need to start jumping up and down too. Why? Because at your place of what appears to be your most greatest defeat, God wants to turn into your greatest victory. Amen. Count on it. Hey, yeah, one, two, nine says, The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I'll give peace. Second thing is this. Zechariah 2 5. For I, declares the Lord, will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. In other words, God says, Not only am I with you, but I've got you covered. Mm, you get it. Not only am I with you, but I got you covered. Have you ever walked with somebody that was with you but didn't have you covered? Yeah. Preach on, preacher. It, it, it's nice to have people walking with you. It, it, it's, it's good. It, it gives you courage. It strengthens you. But when the shots started being fired and the bombs started dropping, you, you look around at some of these folks... They ain't there no more. No, they, they done gone. They was with me, but now they're gone from me. They have disappeared. Not only did the Lord promise to be with them, He promised to cover them. God's got you covered. You know, some folks, and I appreciate this, don't misunderstand me. I, 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 I text encouragement like this at times as well. But you ever had anybody text you or send you a message and say, I got you back? Let me tell you something. God's got you front and your side and above you and below you and behind you. He has you circled in a ring of the fire of His glory. Oh my goodness. And if we'll believe that, here's what you need to know. The enemy can spit and sputter and holler and threaten and do all kinds of things to you in this life from that perspective. But God says this. He says, if he gets too close, I'm going to burn him. Now, y'all didn't get that. Let the devil come on in. 
Let, let, him, let him come on in. Let him get close enough for God to get him. You're still not getting it. He's, the enemy's taunting you. It's about time you taunted the enemy a little bit and say, in the name of Jesus, you come any closer and God's going to burn your hind end. You, you, you're going to be one more scalded devil. That red tail of yours is going to be on fire while you're running the other way. If you mess with me, you're going to have to get that kind of faith. You're going to have to walk there. You're going to have to learn how to do that. God is with you and He has got you covered. If God be for me, who can be against me? The victory is ours when the battle is the Lord's. And the problem is we are too busy trying to fight the battle in our own strength. We think we're trusting God, but the truth of the matter is we aren't. We are trusting our own strength, our own know-how, our own ability to even to pray and to quote the Word. You need to understand, some of this can get really religious. We can do all the right religious things. But if our faith is not built in the glory of the Lord who resides in us, and if our faith is not in Him to get us through, then we are devil lunch. Lastly, again, Zechariah said, Don't do this in your own strength. Don't do this in your own strength. Zechariah 4.6 Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Not by might, nor by strength, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. It's not in how smart you are. It's not in how powerful you are or you think you are. Everything is by the Spirit of God. Yes, you and I have to work it out. Yes, we have to we have to leave captivity and go back to the place of restoration. Yes, we have to get there and we have to clear the rubble out. Yes, we have to deal with the enemy around us. Yes, then we have to begin to rebuild upon the foundation that is laid. But if we do it in our own strength, we'll falter. You see, here's the thing. If God's put something on your heart to do, God's given you a promise. God's told you, I'm going to restore you. God's come to you in the midst of your... Isn't it interesting that when things are going good, the Holy Spirit's speaking things of warning to you, and when things are going bad, He speaks things of encouragement to you? You see, a lot of you, when you get in good times and you start hearing that voice of warning... You rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Better be careful who you're rebuking. It's the Lord warning you. Don't get too proud. Don't get too puffed up. Don't start trusting in yourself. You wouldn't be where you are if it wasn't for me. But then once you mess up, God, 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 doesn't, God doesn't come and say, I told you. Because He knows you already know. So He comes with words of restoration, promises of redemption, and says, all right, we're going to get up and we're going to do this again, but not in your own strength, not in your own power. You see, if you're burning out in pursuing the will of God, you're doing it in your strength and not the Lord's. And you're looking at a prime example of that happening to a man. You see, we all pray we want to do great things for the Lord. It may just be a great thing in our marriage, a great thing with our kids, a great thing on the job, some ministry. If, how many of you know if God gave it to you to do, it's a great thing? It's, it's a great thing. But when you start depending upon your own strength to hold it together, to do it and to accomplish it, 
my friends, you're going to burn out. You can't do it. You, you, somewhere you've got to trust God because, you see, if the devil can get you fighting every fire that gets started, he's going to wear you out. If he starts telling you it depends on you, if he starts telling you, that's God calling, telling you that this is the truth. And you see, this man is telling you the truth this morning. That's a now word. If the devil can get you going around in circles like a dog chasing his own tail. You're going to fall. But if you're willing to just do what God says with the provision that He's given and quit worrying about whether or not you're going to accomplish this or not or thinking that it's up to you, I've learned a huge lesson. Jesus said, upon this truth, I will build my church. Not you would build my church, but I will build my church. And just a word of personal testimony. Jill and I talk about this. I'm just, I'm not stressing out over us. It doesn't mean I don't care. It doesn't mean I don't believe that, I, that God's got plans. I've just put this thing before the Lord in a whole different matter. And I've said, God, I'm just going to keep being obedient. I'm going to keep preaching the Word. I'm going to keep ministering to folks. I'm going to keep loving on people. I'm going to keep pursuing You. I'm just going to be obedient, Lord. And whatever fruit comes out of that, I give You all glory and honor and praise. Now, folks, that's freedom. And God wants you that free in the midst of walking the road. I'm with you. I got you covered.